Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration with the New Art School and Design Didax Podcast. Our guest today is Chris Murphy. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Love Darius. It's, uh, it's good to finally be on together. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic to have you here today. Fantastic. It's been a bumpy fantastic. couple of weeks. We've had a busy uh, two or three weeks in the Murphy household. Um, so, yeah, my wife is a silversmith and she's working on a big commission at the minute, which I, I don't think I can say anything about. It's top secret. Okay. So, okay. Um, but it will be um, revealed soon. Fantastic. Um, fantastic. She's starting to get big commissions, which is great. So, um, it's good. Very pleased for her. Excellent. Excellent. So, tell us about you and your work. Well, I, um, I've worked as a designer for 30 years. Um, I did the stamps, the, the stamps for the Royal Mail in Northern Ireland a long time ago. And that was the point at which my parents thought I had a proper job. Up until then, they thought that designer wasn't a real job. Um, and they, they, they encouraged me to join the police. My dad was a policeman. My grandfather was a policeman. And I don't know, I don't know if you know the history of Northern Ireland, but during the troubles, being in the police probably wasn't the best job. Um, it was quite a dangerous job. Um, and when I did the stamps for the Royal Mail, that's when they thought, okay, this is a kosher job. Um, and I've worked as a designer for 30 years. And for the last 20 years, I've taught at Belfast School of Art, taught, taught interaction design. And the 31st of December last year was my final day. And now I am free, <laughs> free to explore. I think the reason we're talking is because we're looking at education and the future of education and where education is going, specifically design education. And I think that there's never been a more exciting time to, 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 to change education. The pandemic obviously has affected how we teach. And I think that there are massive opportunities for us as educators to, to lean into that and to change design education. So it's exciting. Fantastic, fantastic. Tell us about the projects you're currently working on. I, um, I've, I've got probably a couple of big projects, the School of Design, uh, which used to be called Design Track. And then I bought the School of Design.com. So I don't really know what that is, Left Harris, to be honest with you. Um, it's, it's more sort of like, I describe it as a master's course without a master's price tag. Um, the kind of content I'm covering there, I was working on a course this morning, um, is branding, uh, innovation, design strategy, maybe design thinking. Uh, it's more high level. And then I'm also working on a user interface course called Building Beautiful User Interfaces, which was a collaboration with Adobe. They, you know, they supported my work to, to start to build something. And then the pandemic hit and I, I had to set that work aside and look after my students. Um, and Adobe were great. They just said, look, finish it off in your own time. And so I'm, I'm back into working on that just now. So that is a full course that takes you from nothing to, in, to, to user interface designer. And I'm really loving putting it together. And it's going to be a mixture of uh, video, uh, web-based content and live type taught workshops. And to mm -hmm. me, that's, that's the future, I think, of education. I don't think it's just being in a classroom or just putting uh, uh, videos online or, or just making a book available on the internet. It, it's a blend of all of those things. So yeah, it's exciting, so, I think. Tell us about your path uh, in education. How did you start? Um, I, years ago, I, there was a friend of mine who kind of knew, my wife was teaching at Belfast School of Art. She, she more or less was teaching silversmithing from the point at which she graduated from the Royal College of Art. So she was teaching silversmithing. And I had a, a friend of a friend who asked, who needed someone to teach Photoshop. And that was my job. So I bought a Photoshop book and <laughs> sort of, I think it was called Photoshop Tips and Tricks or something. And I literally read that book from cover to cover so that I could go in and try and teach Photoshop. And, you know, I quickly realized that there's no way that anybody would know all of Photoshop because it's so big. Um, and I had, you know, I had some students at that point in time who, you know, they did, they weren't that interested. And I'd say, why are you, why are you not interested? And they say, I already know Photoshop. And I would pull out this book and say, look, I've read this book, you know, and I don't actually think that people who make Photoshop know all of Photoshop. I just don't believe it's possible for anyone to know Photoshop. And so I, I did that. And then from that, I then was invited to do some workshops. Uh, I used to run a record label. So I was coming in doing workshops about packaging for the music industry. And then a job came up and I applied for it. It was half-time post. 
Um, and so I got that halftime post and that allowed me to, to make my own work as well. And so for a while I worked as an artist traveling around the world doing installations. I ran my record label and I taught and I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was great fun. But that was probably back in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, and education has changed a lot over, you know, since then. So education in 2000 versus education in 2020 is nowhere near the same thing. And I think that that is probably one of, you know, is one of the reasons that I left education. I think that education, without getting too critical about it, because my focus is the future and I try to be positive, I, I do get a little bit concerned that education's about money um, and vast sums of money. And the student experience is maybe lost a little bit in, in, the, in the grandiose plans of vice chancellors. They are looking at buildings and footprints in cities and all of this kind of stuff. And the actual frontline experience of students is maybe not that great. And that, that for me, I, I find that concerning, you know. Fantastic. Yes, absolutely. We are on the same page as you know on this. Issue. Yeah. Uh, tell us tell us about uh, the school that you started and, and how that came up. And so last year I was on a, a program called Propel, which was a pre-accelerator. And I was a mentor on Propel the year before. And it was great fun because like in, in I'd gone back to being a half-time member of staff. So I started as a half-time member of staff. Then I became a full-time member of staff. And then I moved back to being a half-time member of staff because I needed to do my own work in order to have a safety valve. And when I wasn't teaching in the art school, I was teaching, or I wasn't really teaching, I was mentoring startups. And so these two things were, they, they couldn't be more opposite parts of Belfast. I'd have to run to mentor my startups and then I'd have to run back over to the art school to teach students in the art school. Um, and I love teaching the startups because they were full of enthusiasm. They had so much passion. And the contrast between students and startup uh, people who are running startups, that was quite a contrast. And I started to think, I think I'd rather do this actually. Um, so I applied for the accelerator myself. Um, and I think they pretty much had to take me. I, I don't think that they could have not taken me because I was a mentor on the program. And plus when I filled in the paperwork, I said, you know, I was pretty shameless. I said, you know, for 20 years, I've been helping everybody else build a startup. And I think I've pretty much earned the right to, you know, to, for you to give me some support and for me to make a startup. And that was great. It, it gave me some money. Invest and I supported that. Uh, the mentors were amazing. Uh, and I loved it. And then I had a hybrid year where I was building a startup and also helping other startups. And I, I just quit my job. I, August came and I decided, you know, I think the future is, I think the future is teaching like this. Um, I bought all this stuff here uh, so that I could have a, a nice YouTube background. Um, and my son, who does music and video and editing, and he's, he's a wedding photographer, he's coming and helping me take, make videos. And I just, I looked at how other people were making things and selling courses online and thought, you know, there's an opportunity here to, to do, to teach in a different way. And also for me, something that's really important is make that affordable, you know, not 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 make tons of money there are lots of people who are doing online courses who are I think are making tons of money um that's not really who I am as a person uh, you know I don't mind making money but what I am concerned about is 24 people learning user interface design being mentored and you know that feels like a good cohort to me but there's lots of other courses where there's 100 people or 200 people and I just don't see that as being you know it's hard to have a a learning experience with 200 other people in your class so and plus design is very subjective so you know uh, i just yeah i'm enjoying doing so what, building, what learning is materials fantastic tell us about the ethos you started tell us about your school manifesto and uh, how that uh, is different from from everything else well i think it ties into what i said about money um you know one of the things that i've been testing over the last year while i was doing the propel startup thing my first learners I had on a deal, which was I'll teach you for life for 300 pounds. Um, and, you know, and some of those people contacted me and they wanted to know were they going to get a tutorial every two weeks for the rest of their lives. And I said, not really. You know, I mean, what I mean by the rest of your life is I'll get you to the point at which 
you know, you're on, you, you know what you're doing and you understand stuff and maybe you check in with me once a year or something because you're making a big life-changing decision. Um, and what was great was like, you know, 10 people took that chance and came and said that they would come and learn with me for 300 pounds. And one of my first learner, Anda, it, it was an engineer. Uh, she works for a big company called Free Agent, uh, which does software for startups and for people, uh, creative people. And she wanted to not be an engineer. She wanted to be a designer. And I took her through my master apprentice process where you copy other people's work and you learn by looking. And by the time I'd finished with her, I, you know, I'd put her in touch with Vic Bell, who's into, whose you, you, icons she was copying. And I showed Vic the work and Vic, Vic thought it was her work. And I said, no, 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 this is uh, students' work. And Vic was like, what? She thought it, she was looking at her own work because it was so well drawn. And then I set her um, exercises to draw other things that Vic had never drawn in the same style. And she was, I mean, it was amazing. And I looked at Anda as this person who had started with no design knowledge really at all. And by the time she'd finished, she had a, an Instagram, she had a dribble page, she was drawing icons. Then a lot of people come to me to ask me, do you know someone who can help with some branding or, and so I then push that work to those students. And so she did a couple of branding projects. I spoke to the clients, they were delighted. And I thought, this is like a model of education that we could, that we could work with, where, you know, there's a much tighter interface between the learners and industry. And, you know, we support and mentor these people to, to fulfill their, um, their hopes and their dreams. And then we give them, once they've, once they've pinned down the basics and the fundamentals, we give them work to go and try. Uh, and every time I've done that, it's been a success. You know, there's not one, one client who's phoned to say, oh, that was a disaster. Because I think the other thing is the kinds of people that come and learn with you, they're a little bit older uh, they have a bit of life experience. They've already maybe done one or two jobs. And this is really important to them. They really want to make a success of it. And I just don't think the same is true necessarily of students. I think that quite a lot of students go into university because they've been told to go to university, but they don't really know what they want to do. Um, and they're maybe doing a course because their friend is doing that course. Um, and so they came on the course because their friend is there and the friend maybe is enjoying it, but they hate it. And I'm thinking this is so expensive, like, you know, and the other thing for me that's at the heart of what we're doing, if you look at, if you look at my daughter, she's at Glasgow School of Art, which is where I went and which is where Cara and my wife went. When we went to Glasgow, the cost of that education was zero. That was paid for by the government. Okay. Now, that was a social contract in the sense that, you know, we're going to give you this education and in return, hopefully in 10 or 20 years time, you're going to rise up the ranks and pay back more tax and you're going to give back to the economy and you're going to help the country. And I like to think that looking back on my career, I have definitely risen up the ranks and I've definitely given back and I've, I've definitely paid back the, the free education that I had. My daughter, by contrast, is is paying £9,250 a year. And in Scotland, that's four years. So she's gonna pay £37,000 to be educated for four years. Whereas on my interface design course, which is more like a month to six weeks, it's broken down into sprints, um, you're paying $1,400, 1500 right. I mean, the contrast in price is just like, it's, it's, it's huge. It's true. It's true. However, do you see the value of your daughter's degree or is that sort of something different to, to the school? I think that there's, that's a really interesting question. I think that there's a value of that degree just because it's Glasgow School of Art. Um, so Glasgow has obviously a reputation. It's quite hard to get into um, so that there's a reputational value. And I think that as education moves forward, if we if we imagine, say, 50, 100 years into the future, and, and I'm not going to be around to, to see if I was right or wrong. I think we'll see in this country, in the UK, a move similar to America, where you'll have like Yale, Harvard, you'll have these really big um, name brands. Uh, and, you know, Glasgow, maybe for design, the Royal College. And the rest of the universities will have either gone bankrupt or, you know, the, there'll be a big shakeout. Uh, so, they'll, so you'll be paying for reputational 
a piece of paper, which is reputation. And that's one thing. I think that she is learning for sure uh, to be a silversmith. It's not really a degree that you can do at home. You know, like you could do my interaction uh, user interface course. As long as you have a computer, you could do it, right? Mm -hmm. To do silversmithing and jewelry, you need fire. You need, you know, it's not something you can just have at home uh, unless you're unless you're married to a silversmith. Um, so she needs to go to art college to do that. Um, that said, for, for two semesters, because of the pandemic, she hasn't been in the art school, so, yeah. no. Yeah, absolutely. Is she able to use any equipment, or is she able to access any equipment? I believe so. I, I believe they get like a day or so here and there. Um, and honestly, I don't really tend to talk to her about that. Cara does because Cara talk, talk shop with her and they discuss the silversmithing yeah. things. I'm more of an essay helper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, do you think that a lot of these name, big name schools, and I'm not talking about Glasgow specifically. Yeah, yeah. In my experience, the big name uh, does not uh, have an equivalent to what the, that big name used to be generally on an international level. Oh, that's interesting. I think that the big name probably does if it's Cambridge or Oxford. Okay. Um, I think that there probably is a parallel there between say Yale or Harvard or Stanford. And I, I personally think that Glasgow probably does have that uh, reputation. I'm not talking about I, Glasgow. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about your idea about you know, the big names and then smaller independent schools. Well, if you look at um, the papers over the last week or two, uh, the newspapers here, um, one of the things they were talking about was this idea of secret lists. I don't know if you saw this. So um, universities, not all of them, but some universities are making secret offers. They're saying, you know, we don't know what's going to happen this year. The A-levels are going to not be happening. And so don't tell anyone, but you can get a place here. And apparently, because I wasn't really looking at this last year, apparently last year there was a consolidation around some of the bigger universities that expanded and some of the smaller universities that could not get enough students. That's going to happen again this year. And I think we're going to, we're going to end up in a situation where at least one or two universities soon have to close. Okay. And once one university closes and the pain of having that threshold of pain where you have to say to probably two years of students, I'm sorry, but this university is closing and we're either going to transfer you to other universities or we're going to teach you out and then the university shut. Once that pain has happened in one place, it will happen in lots of other places. It'll be like dominoes falling. If you had no limitations, financial or possibilities, or if you had like all the help you wanted, what would you do? What is that education? Uh, that's a really good question. I think Kara, my wife, has always said, um, what you need, Chris, is uh, is like a millionaire or a billionaire to give you, you know, 20 million to get you to the end of your life um, and then just tell you do amazing work and help as many people as possible. I think if I had that millionaire or billionaire and they gave me all the money, I think it would have to be a billionaire, actually. I don't think millionaires are that fancy <laughs> anymore. Um, but I think if they gave me that money and said, do what you think is right, I think what I would do is I would get my head down, full steam ahead, working on things like my digital product design courses. And I would build those classes 50-50. 50% of the people are from, for example, the upcoming class that I have running with the user interface course, one person who's going to be on that course is from Brazil. Yeah, he has no, you know, he can't afford it, um, just financially. Uh, one is a person who's from Nigeria, a lady from Nigeria. She's the same. She just can't afford it. And so what I would, and at the minute I have to have, let's say, 24 people on a course, maybe I could offer four of those places that are essentially free. Um, but I don't think I could offer much more because I, I have to pay my bills. And I would, I would really focus on that. Um, you know, one of the biggest things I think I, I helped with over the last year was a guy who had been to one of these online uh, UX courses that was not great, um, and he'd paid a lot of money for it. And I happened to chat to him on Twitter and said, come over here to the School of Design, I'll give you a hand. And he has grown and grown and grown. He's from, um, he's from Hawaii. His name is Tyler Nishida. And just watching him grow has been amazing. Um, yeah. And, you know, every once in a while he says, hey, can you jump on and give me some advice? And 
you know, and, and not, I don't just give them advice on, you know, that's too red or this light type is too much or, you know, I also give them advice on, you know, do not take that job. That's insane. They are totally exploiting you, uh, you know, so it's a mixture of things. What do you think of the, the future of, of physical teaching? Uh, like, so just, not just online, because you said about, you know, you said about you had, you had your billions, but then you would continue online teaching. I would still would you, do. Yeah, I would still do some physical. No, no, no. I would do some physical. So, for example, okay. this year I've been teaching because my my friend Adam Proctor, who we both run a very occasional podcast called Uneducators, and he asked me to teach the business of design to his second year students, and that uh, that worked because it was all Zoom. Um, I, it, we were using Microsoft Teams, I think, and I said to him, you know, we've one more lecture to go, and then we're finished. And and I said to him, okay. What I'd really like to do next year, if it was possible, would be to fly over to Winchester, do a bit of a two day boot camp so that the students get to know me. Um, you know, because one of the problems I've had with this particular group of students is you're looking at a screen of just letters, they don't put their video on. And uh, whereas oh. with, with, yes, with, with my students, because I taught the, la the first semester and I just said to my students, turn on your video. Yeah. And because they know me, um, you know, one or two would say, oh, I can't put on my video because I haven't put my makeup on. And I'd be like, L look, Hannah, I don't care. Just turn on your video. It's fine. Look at me. I, I mean, I don't look great. Um, and then they would turn on their video. But that's because they knew me and that we had a rapport. Um, and so that was the one thing that was missing with these students. None of them would put their videos on. And so it was very difficult to teach because you couldn't see mm -hmm. the facial expressions and, you know, the engagement. And you also couldn't really be sure that they were there. <laughs> you know, they may have just disappeared off, just shown up at the start and left. And so I said to Adam, what I'd like to do next year would be to go over to Winchester, do two days and run a project or something, maybe for all the year groups and get them working together and then come back and run the classes via right, Zoom right, or, or Teams. Right, right. What would be your best advice about all those students right now who are sort of, let's say, politely uh, quite stressed uh, about employability and, and where all this is leading? And, you know, they're stuck at home. Uh, they're all trying to access some kind of, 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 of employment. What would be your advice? To those students? Yeah, my advice on this has completely changed um, over the course of the year. When this first happened, my advice was if you're not teaching yourself something, if you're not learning something, you know, if you're not using this as an opportunity to learn something new, then you're crazy. Um, and I, fair enough, I got some pushback from some friends who said, okay, what if you're struggling with your mental health and you cannot uh, do that? And I'd run a session at the School of Design where I'd said, you know, if you're not working hard and doing this stuff, then you're completely dead to me, et cetera. You know, not dead to me, obviously, but, you know, you yeah. should learn. You should learn. And then the next day, after having had these discussions with a couple of really good friends who said, well, what if you've got mental health problems or what if you're working in a job at the front line and, you know, and you're stressed and the, the, you, you come back from your job at a supermarket and all you can think about is you, you're going to bed so that you can go and do it again tomorrow. Oh, it, was, it was right. And I, I the next day, and my daughter was there as well. She was one of the people moving into this thing. Um, and I said, okay, yeah, I want, before we start today's session, I want to say something really important. Yesterday, I said this, and I was wrong. I, it, here's why I was wrong. And then I explained, and then I said, okay, so here's my advice now. Um, for starters, I think too few people do that. I think that a lot of people, you know, they'll say X, then someone will prove them wrong. And then they'll think, oh, yeah, that's right. But then they won't have the humility to say I was wrong. Right. Um, and I think that's so important. My advice now would be do the best that you can. I think that most employers would understand that the last year has been incredibly difficult. And so everybody's story will be different. You know, um, you if you haven't been able to get into university and you've only been able to work on Zoom, well, you know, share that story and just be honest. But still, I would say there are amazing learning opportunities. You know, there's lots of things that you can be showing up. The one thing that this thing has shown me, and I can see you're about to ask a question. The one thing no. this whole pandemic has shown me is that we're making contact with people that we, we didn't, you know, there's no reason we couldn't have been talking four Absolutely. years ago. Um, and yet we're talking because of the pandemic. And this afternoon, a, a friend of mine, Johanna, who I, used to see at Brooklyn Beta in New York every year, we're having a coffee on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. 
No, I was just. Oh, we haven't say, done that for years, you know. I was just going to say if you could be a bit more specific about, you know, the, 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 the oh that advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, my so something sort of because I see. I mean, there's a lot of. You 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 are in in, in we are in the same uh, area. Uh, we mentor students. We are in, in mentoring groups and everything. I can see that the increased stress mm. of students. Uh, you know, needing, for example, needing, for example, to get some real work experience in a company, in a physical company, because it's very hard to set up on your own, for, you know, for, for, from from the get-go, you need some, some years. Yeah, well, but what how, I would suggest is yeah, this. Yeah. Go and find yourself a mentor, okay? There are a lot of people who have design experience who know about the situation and who want to give back. So, of course. You, so, so find yourself a mentor. I, I write about this in the first chapter of my user into Facebook, where I talk about mentoring from afar. You know, you can find a mentor. They could be in San Francisco and you're yes. in Glasgow, or they could be, you know, you find yourself a mentor. That mentor, I think, if they're a good mentor, will push opportunities your way. So, for example, I had a student a year ago, ish, middle of the pandemic, she contacted me, she was one of mine, and she said, could I, you know, could you give me some extra projects to do or give me some advice on what yeah. could I work on? And, I, you know, I was pretty honest with her. I said, look, I don't think you're the best designer in the world, um, you know, but I'm not saying that to kill your, you know, enthusiasm. I'm saying it because you're really good at this over here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I can say this because I'm leafing, whereas before I would never have said that because um, it would have led to too many complaints. But I said, you're really good at um, research, organization, all of this stuff. Go and do that. Yeah. Um, she went off and she did that work. And then she checked back in with me. I gave her some advice for some other things to do. And then another ex-graduate of mine from 10 years previously said, who would you recommend to employ? I need to hire somebody. And I said, look, this lady here you know because she was in the forefront of my mind because i was mentoring yeah. her yeah um and she got that job yeah uh, absolutely you know just, so just, i would say find that mentor because yeah, yeah, the mentor yeah. can help you not just with things to do um but can could also really help you with the mental health part absolutely well. absolutely adp list is a very good place to find mentors by the way adp, ADP list, list okay. is really good right. is a really good place for that sort of a lot a lot of help is a lot of help is available there Another place to find a mentor is Twitter. Uh, I mean, yeah, a lot of, of students, I, I find, roll their eyes when I say, are you on Twitter? And they think it's a waste of time, <laughs> et cetera. But it, it's not, you know? Of course, um, but it's already filtered for you. You know, ADP is, is designed towards design, towards sort of, there, there, there's filters in place and there's there's approvals. People get approved, okay. like, for being professional. Okay. So it's okay. a really good place. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Um, the scale of Oh, one thing I forgot to say was... Yeah. Um, I have this big library of content, which is library.theschoolofdesign.com. And that's stuff I'm working on still. Um, and the idea there was that, you know, if somebody was in the School of Design, and there's about 40-ish people in the School of Design, if someone was in the School of Design, they asked a question like, how do I set up a mailing list? Instead of, instead of just answering that person in a DM, I would try and write it out and put it into the library. Absolutely. And then, you know, the library's in a bit of a reorganization phase at the minute. I'm trying to catalog things a little bit more carefully. Um, but that's been helpful for people, you know, to be able to go and find. It's essentially everything I've ever taught. But the Absolutely. other thing I would stress just now, uh, Left Harris, is I'm using a tool called Pathrite. I don't know if you heard of Pathrite. No. Oh, it's really nice. It's the only... It's the only learning management system I have found that really I that, that looks really nice. Path right. Um, path right. It's for building learning pathways. Um, and it has like six different types of content, like read, for example, you could read this thing and then take this quiz, watch this video, listen to this audio. And you basically build pathways, lessons, which are small pathways. It's very visual. And, you know, once you've done certain things, you complete that step and you move to the next one. If you look at tools like Teachable, the navigation is over here and the yeah, stuff that yeah, you're doing yeah. is over here. And yeah. there's a little bit of a disconnect between where you are in the journey. What I like about Pathright is that you're in the path. So you can see where you are on the journey. Excellent. And they have been helping. They have a, a, 
a fantastic guy called Christian Shockley, who's like a, who runs an ad lab thing every week. So he will jump on uh, Zoom with you and help you structure your learning materials for Pathrite. So I'm busy building courses now in Pathrite. Um, and Fantastic. I think the first ones of those, probably I'm going to be introducing like less than a hundred pounds. Uh, so that's the next thing. Excellent. Excellent. So, so how can our viewers and listeners best find you? Um, on Twitter, I'm Fehler, F-E-H-L-E-R. I, yeah, I was very early to Twitter, but I yeah. wish I'd got my name, Mr. Murphy. Um, <laughs> but I was so into the music industry at the time that yeah. I was Fehler, which is German for mistake. Um, and my work was all to do with mistakes. So um, I, that was my username. Um, but so I'm uh, Fehler, F-E-H-L-E-R on Twitter. Um, and I'm the School of X uh, on Twitter and Instagram. And then what I'm doing with the School of X is run, I'm about to start a podcast where the X is going to change every month. So it's like this month, the X is marketing. So the School of Marketing. So we're going to talk to Rob Hope in South Africa. And then the next month, the School of X, X is education. So we're going to look at, and, I, and my son said, oh, that's a really cool idea. And I thought, well, that must be okay then. So <laughs> Excellent. Uh, what is the last advice you'd like to leave us with? What's the last what piece of advice? Yes. Oh, I suppose my last piece of advice is there are no rules. Um, I've been saying this a lot recently. I yeah. talked about my record label where I did a lot of things that were breaking the rules. And I'm now making slides about the principles of communication design where I'm breaking rules. So, for example, I have a box and you put seven lines you know, you've got this square and you've got seven lines and where do you put the seven lines? And in one of the examples, I put the seven lines outside the box yes. and people would look at it and go, yeah, but that's not fair. You're breaking the rules. I mean, like says who, right? There's no <laughs> rules. Um, so my advice would be like all rules are constructs. So, you know, break the rules. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming. It's been fantastic talking to you and looking forward to seeing you at the Design Education Forum. Yes. This November. So, so uh, let's get organized. Have a fantastic day.